This is the YouTube version of Philosopher Rock episode 11. Everything we do at Philosopher Rock is offered for free. We do it for the love of it. And so because of that, we are very careful not to infringe on anybody's copyright. So to that end, if there is anything within this video that you consider that shouldn't be there, you can write to us, philosopherrock at gmail.com, philosopherrock at gmail.com. You can write to us if you own those images and we will take them down. Um, also, to that end as well, we also do not use any of the artist's original music, again, for the same reason. And therefore, we are very, very grateful to both bands, Acrolith and Black With The Stars, whose music you will hear throughout this episode. All right, so that's enough. If you have any issues, you can write to us. Let's get on with this episode. This is Philosopher Rock, episode 11, and this is our personal tribute to Burke Shelley and Budgie. Welcome to Philosopher Rock, where two guys have rock in their heads. special edition of Philosopher Rock, a tribute to Burke Shelley and Budgie. Now before I bring Brian on here, let me just give you an ever so brief overview of Budgie and the reason we decided to go ahead and hit record on this episode. Budgie were a Welsh band from Cardiff that was formed in the late 60s and were active on and off up until 2010. Budgie were one of the heaviest bands back in the day and were an influence on a number of bands who came after them. They put out 11 studio albums between 1971 and 2006 and a number of live albums. They had a huge gap between the release of their 1982 album Deliver Us From Evil and the 2006 release You're All Living In Cuckoo Land. Budgie have been labelled heavy metal, hard rock and progressive rock. The group had a number of members pass through over the years but the mainstay was bassist and vocalist Burke Shelley. For most of their time together, Budgie was a trio with what many would say the classic lineup consisting of Shelley, guitarist Tony Borge and drummer Ray Phillips, or for others it's with drummer Steve Williams who first appeared on the Bandolier album. The group disbanded and reformed a number of times and there were other musos who passed through during the life of the band, but the focus of this discussion is on the band in general and on Burke Shelley who sadly passed away this year on 10 January 2022. I did say just now that this is a very special edition of Philosopher Rock. We won't be doing our thorough examination of all things budgie, like we did with Say Yes, which we spread over two episodes, and we really could have gone for three for that one, but I had to get out the editor's razor. So no, it won't be like that at all. This episode will be much more subjective than anything else we've done before. This is personal for both Brian and I, so while there will be some objective material here, it just won't be typical Philosopher Rock. Part of the reason here is that we didn't know whether to do a standalone episode of our other show, 4550 RPM, dedicated to Burke, or something else. But we decided against that, since the format of 4550 is shorter and sharper than Philosopher Rock. So here, we decided to do little to no research, and just hit record and share our thoughts about Budgie and Burke Shelley. If you're a member of the Budgie Facebook group, or you're a family member of Burke's, or if you simply are a huge fan of Budgie, please stay listening for a few minutes after we say hooroo to Brian. Okay, enough of the intro, let's get to our tribute to Budgie and Burke Shelley.
Well, here we are again, Brian. It's been a while since you and I have uh, recorded a show together. But, um, yeah, like, as you know, we want to talk about uh, Burke Shelley from Budgie. And, Brian, I think I told you only a few weeks before Burke Shelley died that I had scoured the internet for his contact details because I thought, oh, you and I had spoken about it before that we should um, we should have Burke on the show. So I was trying to find out, and, I, you know, I went to every place I could go, um, the one place I didn't try was Facebook. Maybe it would have had some success through there, but I tried the fan pages and every other place that I could think of. I spent an afternoon, to be honest, looking for a contact. I just couldn't find anything. And then a couple of weeks after that, to find out that uh, uh, Burke had died, uh, I'll be honest with you, Brian, I did shed a few tears. And... Um, uh, because uh, I, I love Budgie, um, got a big lot of respect for Burke. Uh, you and I have a lot in common with Budgie. Uh, I'll never forget um, when I first met you in the internet world, Brian, the first photograph of you I saw, you there with your Budgie shirt on. And um, <laughs> uh, my history with Budgie, I um, started listening to them um, with the Bandolier album because um, I, I, I'm, I'm not as old as I sound, and I didn't really know a lot about them before that. But it was around about that era that I began to listen to Budgie. And, uh, you know, as time goes on and you learn about people, and, um, you know, I eventually became a bass player myself. And so, um, you know, Burke Shelley, uh, like a lot of other people, he's one of my, I won't say idols, but, you know, someone I look up to, and uh, it's a great loss. Um, and uh, so anyway, we're going to talk about Burke Shelley and Budgie. So I'll throw it to you, Brian, to maybe you can talk a bit about what you think about uh, Burke and Budgie. Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to say, you know, it's great to be back in conversation with you again. Many things have changed since the last time we talked. We don't have enough time to go into all that right now. But suffice it to say that it's for me, it's been too, too long in between. But. Here we are, so it's good to be back. I thank you for uh doing this with me again, another episode. And um yeah, I mean this was you know, it's sort of a bittersweet meeting, the fact that we we had actually talked years ago about focusing an episode on Budgie. And that was one of the things that I think um I might have put lit a fire under you to do all this trying to, you know, find some contacts for Burke, but it was because I had said, you know, we got it would be great. I felt, I felt somehow like maybe it was just the fact that we knew, we both knew that Burke Shelley was a Christian or whether it was just my own naivety thinking that I, <laughs> we'd be able to get somebody like him on the show. But I, I, I think one of the things that um, prompted me was the fact that because I had been ordering directly from them from the website and 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 actually ordering autographed personally autographed items, I thought, well, you know, I'm really only probably one or two people removed from Berg himself, you know, and so I thought, well, if I could just get through a couple of channels, you know, it's not like trying to get a hold of somebody, you know, that's completely out of out out of the realm of possibility. I just felt like maybe we had a chance. And uh he he always just struck me as such a such a, a humble guy and also the fact that he 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 really seemed to in everything that I've seen and heard, he really seemed to be appreciative of his fans. He he never he never um had that sort of um you know, I'm I'm up here and you're down that here kind of thing. Yeah. He, yeah. He always seemed like he was, he was always like almost surprised that people had such an interest in him and his music. But, but yeah, so you had sent me a message because you were doing some other reconnaissance work and I won't talk about that right now, but, um, but to say that, you know, maybe for the listeners to sort of give them something to possibly look forward to, but, um, you had sent to me a message that said, well, you better hurry up if you, if, if we're going to get a hold of Burke and you had said he's not doing well. And I thought to myself, well, I didn't know this. Um, I honestly had tried to search on Facebook. There, there's a fan page on there. I did, I did some research myself to try to figure out where he was living and also 
if he had any, if he was married and who, who just try to find some family members. And I was in, unsuccessful, um, and getting first, you know, past like the first gate there. But, um, as far as how I came to, uh, knowledge of Budgie was, uh, uh I, I feel a little bit cheesy saying this, but <laughs> it's the truth. It was Metallica that really got me into him because back in, on their album, I guess it was 88, was it about 88 or 89, whenever uh, in their album Justice for All came out, what they did was they started doing these singles, like they would put out singles for the album, which was new for them on that album because their their previous albums weren't um, big enough, they weren't popular enough to, to actually release singles for for songs off their albums. But this one they were going for the, you know, top 40 type uh crowd, uh, even though their music was still pretty metal and it was, it really hadn't cracked onto the radio scene yet, but they were releasing singles. And, uh, of course, back then the technology that I had was, uh, I had a turntable, of course, and I had a cassette player. So I bought everything on cassette. Well, they had these cassette, cassette singles and they called them singles. And, um, so I bought the recent one for, which was at the time recent for Metallica. And it was, uh, I think the song was, Metallica's song was Eye of the Beholder. And on the B side was this song called Bread Fan. So I'm like, okay, what does that even mean, Bread Fan? I'm thinking of a guy like taking a loaf of bread and, you know, <laughs> shoving it into a fan. <laughs> like, what is that even? So, so then I looked, I looked at the, uh, the writing credits and I saw underneath that it was, um, not the members of Metallica. So I'm like, okay. They, they, cool, they did a cover song. Well, you know, a couple albums before that, they had done their Garage Days uh, Revisited, where they were kind of saying, like, this is the kind of stuff that we used to rock out to when we were playing covers or whatever. And they had done cover songs on that. Well, they had actually done a Budgie song then, but I didn't, I had no idea that it was a Budgie song. So, um, cause they did Crash Course and Brain Surgery on yeah. that one. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I heard Bread Fan and I was like, man, this is a ripping song. And, uh, at that time, Metallica was like the best cover band in the world, man. You, it, you know, before they sort of went commercial and kind of changed their sound a little bit, but man, you, you get them doing a cover tune and it's like nobody could do it better. So yeah, I, that, that sparked my interest in Budgie. And, um, you know, part of how that goes back a little ways is, um, so, you know, my entry was, honestly, my entry to Budgie was, when they were no longer a band, an active band. Um, when you got into them, they were still an active band. So me getting into them then, I'm looking back at a band who is no longer around. I'm, I'm trying to find, and really, from a United States perspective, they were obscure, an obscure band. I really didn't know much about them. So immediately, uh, you know, and one of the things that sort of prompt my, prompted my, um, my appetite for searching out obscure bands was, I don't know if you guys had these. Tell me if you did. Um, my buddy, really close friend of mine, lifelong friend, he used to go to the library and he would steal books. <laughs> <laughs> he would check some of them out, but then other ones that he didn't want to take back to the, to the library, he would just keep. And I, I, I always thought, well, aren't you going to get in trouble for that? Nah, I said, nah, they just, they send you a few notices and then they either leave you alone or the next time you come in, they, they consider, they consider it. Oh boy, there goes Bowser again. Okay. Let me start. I'm going to let him get this out of his system. And then, so he said, now nah, usually they, what they do, the library will just send you a few notices that you've got an overdue book. And then after it reaches a certain amount, you know, you come in, check out a new book. They say, Hey, you've never brought this book back. We're considering it, you know, lost or damaged or whatever. And they would just charge you whatever a replacement fee was or something, some, you know, small fee. So what he found out was he would check out the books he wanted to read and then he'd take them back. The ones he wanted to keep, he'd just keep. So he had this really, really cool. And I haven't seen them since because I don't know how to look them up, but they're like family tree history, uh, books of bands, popular bands. 
Have you guys ever seen those? Have you had? Have you had? No, those? that's weird because I was just telling you about that. You used to go to the library. We, we just had this conversation, right. and you used to go to the library and get family tree books like Ancestry, like pre-internet uh, days, and right. that's how I found my family ancestry by one of those books. But it wasn't for bands. I, I haven't heard of that before. Yeah, no, this was an actual published book. Mm. I don't know whether the ones that you're talking about that we were talking about well, earlier. These were but... books. These were books, published books. Oh, okay. And you used to go okay. and you could look up, you know, say if your surname was Smith, well, you're in trouble there if it's Smith, but if your surname was Smith, <laughs> you go and look up every person uh, in your city that's researching ancestry of the name of Smith. Um, mm, okay. So but anyway, sorry, uh, that's just a coincidence that we only spoke about that about 10 minutes ago. Right, right, right. So, yeah, um, he, what he would, well, he had this book and he had several of them actually. And there were different volumes. You know, there was ones for prog rock, prog rock, ones for heavy metal. And what you would do is they were, they were nice because they were like, uh, the page, the pages were, um, two pages wide and they were pretty decent sized books. And you'd open it and instead of holding it, you know, like you would a normal book, you'd hold it upright, kind of like you would like a, a centerfold magazine, if you know what I'm getting at. No, I never saw them. <laughs> so they had. What are you talking about? Like a, <laughs> you know, Jay Giles centerfold. That's uh, an American thing. But uh, I know, I know that song. I actually almost rode a car off. Uh, me and my friends listening to that song went a bit overboard and uh, got the old uh, big old Chrysler sideways listening to that song. So that one I'll never forget because. My eyes are popping out because I'm trying to control this big old Chrysler going sideways down a road with everyone rocking out to Jay Gold's band Centerfold. So that's one I'll never forget, but uh, do carry on. Yeah, so um, in this book, what it would do would be, so let's say, for example, um, they would have Deep Purple at the top. And then what the branch would come down and they have a line that comes down off deep purple and it would branch out, you know, left and right and all different ways of all the different members and which ba- bands they were in. And so you would have it all the way back to the, the furthest roots that they were either able to trace or that, you know, some of the members of the bands might not have, uh, some of the members of the bands might not have had anything significant, uh, you know, in their early days. But anyway, it's the, the first thing that was most notable by the members of the band. So, what what happened was like let's say for example with the with Deep Purple, like I'm looking at Deep Purple and I'm like wait a minute these guys were in other bands and and so I'm looking at it like wait you know Ian Gillen episode six who who in the world are they you know never heard of them so you know in my teenage years I would search out like the obscure bands I wanted to find the bands behind the bands I wanted to find the bands that the members were in before you know it, it, even as far back as I could even if they had like a really cruddy recording of them you know playing in like a, a club or something I, you know it'd be satisfactory to me but so I went on a quest for Budgie and and once uh I realized that Metallica had also done the crash course in brain surgery I was like okay this band Budgie's got something going on here I'm gonna find some more stuff by them so what I really did was, uh, at the time, you know, pre-internet, the only way that I knew was the local record stores, right? So I still being somewhat naive at, at a teenager or whatever, I, I didn't, we had one really good record store in town and that guy, he, he didn't know the obscure stuff. He knew that he knew the, the newer stuff. So Budgie was, was, was lost on him. But what I did do was I went to the corporate place here called uh, Record Town. They're, and they're not around anymore, but up at the mall. And there was a girl that worked there who knew every time I came in, she was, you know, I was going to be asking for something weird. And, uh, <laughs> you're that guy. <laughs> so, yeah. And it, it was funny. I think she got a kick out of it because, uh, I think she got a kick out of it because, well, not only was I a long haired guy in a local rock band, but it was like she would, uh, she would, it was kind of like a challenge for her, I think, you know what I mean? It's like I would come in and say, you know, do you have anything by this band or, you know, have you ever heard of this band? And she'd be like, no, I never heard of them. Well, the funny thing was I walked into the, the store the one day and I said, do you have anything by Budgie or have you ever heard of Budgie? She's like, I got one of their albums at home. And I was like, really? Yeah. So she said, but most of their stuff is difficult to get. She said most of it's out of print. So, of course, this is a corporate 
you know, a corporate uh, record store, something something akin to like Tower Records or whatever. And and so they she had she gets out from underneath the counter, she grabs this big binder and she blows the dust off of it and she's <laughs> flipping through these pages and it was a catalog of all the stuff that they were able to order. It was basically their distributors. So she looked in there and she's like, okay, well they've got like nine albums listed here and I'm like, oh man, you know that to me that's like. You know, I'm like, okay, so this isn't going to be just a a band who had like two albums and, you know, and I'm going to be, be left wanting more. They've got a good depth of uh, material here. So she's going through and she's like, she used to have to fill out this paper slip every time because there was no, I mean, the, the computers that they had weren't, you know, no, there was no internet. So she's, I said, order all of them. Just wow, put them down. I said, go ahead and order all of them. And, and I said, We'll see which ones I get. And so she ordered all of them. She called me, you know, a couple of weeks later and she's like, Hey, I got uh, one of your albums in up here. And I was like, Oh man. So I go up there and the only one that she was able to get that was available Can was, I guess? uh, sure. Is it if I were Britannia, I'd waive the rules? No, no, it wasn't uh, that one. Okay. No, it was impeccable. Impeccable. The next it's, album. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so then I, I, I look at the cover and I'm like, this looks like it's not going to be very good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, this got this really creepy kind of poor, poorly for, photographed cat trying to, you know, leap into the air and bite this out, out of proportion, out of proportion budgie. You know, it's like the, the budgie, the cat's way bigger than the bird. But, um, and I thought, I don't know, man. I, I looked at the, I looked at the, um, the label and it was like, okay, it's A&M Records. You know, they, they've been dependable for some, some good stuff in the past, some good rock. So, so I looked at the song titles and then I was like, what in the world? And I'm like, I'm like, what? Cause I remember I had only really ever heard two songs by Budgie and Metallica was doing them up and, and they were, they were ripping them, you know, met, metalized metalized version so i i was like okay well you know i sort of i i said if i don't buy this what happens do you have to you know do you have to eat the cost and she's like well we can send it back to the distributor so i said well i'll go ahead and take a chance and uh and maybe i'll like it you know i like these other songs so what i did was i immediately went out to the car of course i had a cassette i had bought it on cassette which was not my ideal I had wanted it on vinyl or something, but so I, uh, I go out to the car and rip the cellophane off and I put it in and it starts off with melt the ice away and I was hooked. I was like, this is great. This is, I was like, this is even better than the Metallica version as far as like it had everything that I, that I loved in it and, and you'll be able to attest to this. Well, strangely enough too, Melt the Ice Away, Megadeth did a cover of that as well. Did they? Yeah. Oh man. So that particular song, yeah. But yeah, sorry, go on, yeah. And so now I've got, now I've got, uh, something else to search out. I, yeah. I never knew that they did a cover of that. Yeah. So, um. <laughs> you heard that? So, uh, yeah. 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 Carry so on. So <laughs> I, um. Yeah, that's fine. The, the the sound grabbed me right away because what I heard in it, and, and I was going to talk about this later, but I'll bring it up now. And like I said, maybe you can attest to some of this too, was what I heard in it was I heard a little bit of Rush. I heard a little bit of Black Sabbath. And I heard a little bit of kind of like in a, in a strange way, progressive rock. You know what I mean? Um, it wasn't, it wasn't in like a really long song or anything, you know, the songs weren't really long or anything. And then, I, you know, as I'm moving on, I'm starting to get into the the rest of the tracks, and I'm like, well, this isn't, it's kind of slowing down a little bit. It's getting, getting this little groove going on. It's not exactly the uh, the hard rock that the first opening track was. But I had already been a, a fan of, you know, Led Zeppelin. I mean, and Led Zeppelin, you, they could go from screaming hard rock to, from screaming hard rock to, you know, acoustic folk music. So it didn't, it didn't throw me that much, but, uh, I started to just really fall in love with it and it just had this really laid back. And, and I'm glad that I got into them at the, on that album because I don't know that I would have 
I don't know that I would have liked them as much if I would have heard the earlier stuff, their versions of the earlier stuff. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure if I would have liked it as much, but that, but Impeccable had just this right mix of rock. And it was like, you could tell these guys, of course it was, you know, what their fifth, fourth or fifth album uh, maybe even later in that six, uh, seven, seven, album. seven. Yeah. So what we're talking about here is the 1978 release of Impeccable. Yes. And I could tell that this was a, a band that was per- perfectly working together. Like they, they had been around for a while. They weren't just trying to still find their way in the rocks in, in, in music. They, these guys knew what they were doing. Everything was calculated and it was, it was coming straight from the heart. It was, and even though the one track you hear them kind of like, they leave a little bit of the, the leader tape before the song starts. You hear them like cracking a joke. And if you turn the volume up real loud, you can hear them crack a joke. And, uh, and I'm like, yeah, these guys are just having a good time, comfortable in the, in the studio. And, and so, yeah, I just fell in love with that album. And, um, then, um, since I've already dragged this out long enough, I'll just say that I started going to record conventions, which was, I found was much easier to, uh, find the obscure stuff and a buddy of mine turned me on to record conventions. I was like, oh, it's like, wow, there's places that you go to and they just have like records and stuff and music. Yeah. Every once in a while they come through. So we started going to record conventions and I made it a point to go and find, search out every budgie LP that I could, that I could get and, uh, bought them. Yeah. So were you able to find all of the albums? Cause you know, they released, I think eventually, uh, 11 studio albums and some live albums, but, but were you able to find those, let's say eight or nine or 10 albums that might have been out at that time at those record conventions? So yes, I was and I bought most of them. Uh, some of them were a little too pricey at the time. Um, because there were, there were a few people who knew that Metallica had covered them and, and, you know, so even though they were still r- relatively obscure in the United States, um, and, and, you know, keep in mind that I'm a kid growing up in the eighties and, uh, bands that I thought were obscure might not have necessarily been as obscure, you know, that I just hadn't heard of them because that was funny because I, I was thinking to myself like, man, th- these guys are so good. It's a shame. Nobody knows who they are. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, well, hold on a minute. You know, the world is bigger than Cincinnati, Ohio. There might be other people in, in the rest of the world on the planet that might know this band, you know. And um, so it, there was there was a transition happening, you know, in the music industry, obviously, to digital, so CDs. But at the time, you know, so like, for example, you asked about finding the records. So like the album Never, uh, Never Turn Your Back on a Friend. I wanted that album, but it was like 35 bucks, you know, used at, at a record convention. And back in the and day so, when $35 was worth more than it is now, we've always got to acknowledge that when we're talking about things in the past, because, you know, I can remember buying LPs um, of, you know, the latest uh, bands, uh, the latest issues, you know, for 4 and $5. Uh, and you go, well, that's not very much, but, you know, 4 or $5... You know, in the 70s and 80s, if you compare it now, that's that's so 35 dollars in your era is is not is you know I'm I'm not saying it's you know it's not thousands, but it, it's not to be sneezed at either when you know you're a young person and you know you haven't got a lot of money anyway. Plus, if you're like me and you you know have an insatiable appetite for because <laughs> I know you've got thousands, music. you have thousands of LPs. Uh, I, don't, I yeah. hope you don't mind me saying that, but I know you've got. You know, thousands of them. But anyway, sorry. Um, yeah, carry on. So I, what, what I ended up doing was I somehow, I can't remember how I came across a, a distributor who I could buy from directly and I, they had, uh, CD copies. So I thought, well, you know, the CD, the CD was expensive as well, but I was like, you know, if I'm going to get a, a copy CDs at the time, you know, it was like that was the holy grail of, of, you know, music formats. So I thought, well, if I'm going to pay 30 bucks for a CD, I'll go ahead and get the, the CD over the, the LP, which is 35, you know. Um, of course, I, I wasn't, you know, quite the vinyl snob that back then that I was now. I mean, I, I couldn't be. I had a really, <laughs> a really bad turntable. But I mean, I had a turntable, 
nonetheless. But so yeah, what I ended up doing was the ones that I found but didn't want to pay the high prices for, which was only a, it was only maybe two or three of them. I ended up just getting calling the distributors and, and it was mail order basically. I mean, that's literally what it was. But back then it was like, that was kind of an odd thing too, because people, uh, actually I think I know how I found out to, about those CDs to that distributor because the girl who worked at the record store, she said, I've got a copy on CD of uh, Never Turn Your Back on a Friend. And I was like, well, I'll, I'll buy it from you. And she's like, no, no, I'm not getting rid of it. So, <laughs> so she said, but, but I'll tell you where you can get it. So, but that just turned me on to a whole other mail order thing where I was like, oh my goodness, now, you know, I'm seeing other bands in there. And I just, that started me off on a whole other quest of, well, who's this band? And, you know, looking for other stuff. So Impeccable got me into them. And then I worked my way, um, uh, sort of through the catalog back and forth sort of way, you know, like I, I think I got, um, if I were Britannia next and I thought, okay, this is awesome. You know, you, it's like you hear a song like Black Velvet Stallion and you're, it's just like, forget about it. This, these guys are awesome, you know, and, uh, with my affinity for proggy type stuff and the sort of softer, jazzier and even funk kind of stuff. Which they did have a little bit of that woven in there, especially especially at, at that juncture in their career. But yeah, it um, it really turned me on to them because they kind of had everything that I liked. In they weren't just myopic like where a band like Black Sabbath, you would get a, an occasional like softer tune, which was great. But for the most part, a Black Sabbath album was going to be pretty heavy all the way through, and Budgie could go from crushingly heavy to liltingly light in one song you know? <laughs> they could swing that's the beauty of budgie yeah that's what i, I like about them yeah but what i was saying earlier about uh, their sound was i had had come to find out later that burke shelley played a you know a lot of times he played a rickenbacker bass which had that same kind of sound as getty lee from rush and he not only did he kind of resemble Getty Lee a little bit, you know, his face face or whatever. But uh he could hit those really high notes and kind of like get Getty Lee. So you know, I already liked Rush, so immediately anything that kind of resembled Rush. And then Tony Borges uh from Budgie, the guitar player from Budgie, his his sound sounded a, a bit like Tony Iommi, you know, of Black Sabbath. And so come to find out later he played an SG, you know, and uh so that they, they both played SGs. Uh, they were both named Tony. <laughs> they both, you know. So it was, and they were a three piece. Yeah. So yeah. you know, Budgie was a three piece. Rush was a three piece. So I, I just was finding that all these little things that ticked these boxes for me about bands that I already liked, Budgie was like right in that same zone. And so another thing too was, you know, just the fact that over the years, so many people had never heard of them. And it was kind of one of those things, it's like that double-edged sword where you want other people to have heard of them so you can talk about them with people. Like, you know, isn't this song great or this song great? But most people are just like, I don't know who that is. And then you try to explain it or you show them and they're just like, eh, nah. But I started to realize like, okay, I'm kind of in a niche group here, you know, like, and it, it kind of gives you that little Ooh, feeling yeah, of exclusive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So like, yeah, I know, I I know what the good stuff is. You guys are missing out on all yeah. this good stuff. But. And, and it's it's a bit different nowadays with the internet and the widespread access of media uh, that these sort of things don't necessarily uh, these little exclusive groups don't necessarily exist as such in the way that right. we're talking here because the moment you release something like who knows us talking about this and putting it on the internet, the next day you could get a hundred new fans of Budgie who would be talking about it. Whereas back in the day, like what you're talking about, it's very hard to find somebody. Like I had a similar, somewhat similar experience to you now. Um, you know, I was uh, born in Australia, but I spent a lot of my childhood in New Zealand. And when I was a right. young fella, um, and, and New Zealand was way behind the rest of the world when it came to music. Um, if something was released, even in Australia, it didn't turn up in New Zealand for months later. But uh, as a, a, a teenager, I, I remember walking into this, um, this uh, record shop where 
And I'm flicking through the record albums and, you know, I couldn't afford anything, you know, and I come across this album and it had these budgies riding a horse, you know, the the, the album cover just brilliant <laughs> and, you know, holding rifles up in the air. I thought, oh, that looks cool, you know, just by the, the cover and it was Budgie's Bandolier album, you know, and it had it, it just sort of come out. I am talking about sort of 75, 76 year, and I thought, oh, I've got to have that just for the album cover, you know, because uh, right. that's what I was thinking because don't forget back in the day, if you couldn't find, say, a poster of something, um, you just couldn't get, download something off the internet. And I thought, oh, I've got to have that. And, uh, and that's where it started for me, much like you. But the thing is, Brian, I'm still mm-hmm. stunned to this day that this little town in New Zealand and this little tiny record shop that had ABBA and um, all the old old records, you know, um, uh, all the old cabaret-style stuff that you could think of, and then you flick yes. through the rock section, you know, you might find, oh, Black Sabbath or something, you know, maybe, maybe. And there's this uh, budgie sitting there, and um, I think that's really where I, I started. And in that era, now, um, now Bandolier isn't my favourite album of theirs. Um, I'll just maybe, maybe just chuck it in here. Now, I um, found that um, as things have gone on, for me, their final album, You're All Living in Cuckoo Land, really ended up being my favourite because there's mm-hmm. a lot of great messages in there. Uh, I found that, you know, the, the messages as time went on, because, uh, you know, in, in their back catalogue, there's a lot of humour, tongue-in-cheek lyrics, which I enjoy. Um, you've only got to hear the title, If I Were Britannia, I'd Wave the Rules, because we all know that there's a bit of a, a dig at, you know, rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. <laughs> right. So, you know, a bit of tongue-in-cheek stuff, but I found that the messaging uh, became a lot more solid in You're All Living in Cuckoo Land, uh, it won't be to every every other budgie fan's um, taste, but I just found that that really hit it for me. And you have been very generous to me over the years, sending me uh, budgie items and autographed budgie albums that you've sent me over the over the years. And um, very very grateful to you for your couple of autograph things that you've sent me, but especially your all living cuckoo land because it ended up being my favourite. And um, I don't know, I can't pick one track to point out on that one. There's still that tongue in cheek stuff because you know mm-hmm. the title. One of the tracks of the final title on the album, I'm compressing the comb on a cockerel's head, right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but if you look into the lyrics, there's actually a, a serious theme to that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, the title track, We're All Living in Cuckoo Land, uh, if you haven't listened to that, that really, uh, now this album's been out for some 14 or 15 years, but if you listen to that now more than ever, they're really talking about what we're getting served up, and I think that really speaks to me. I really appreciate that. And in that era, Budgie had come out to Australia um, and uh, I was living up in um, Toowoomba uh, in Queensland at the time, and they had played, hmm, where was it? I think it was the Hi-Fi in Brisbane, and I know my sons will know the Hi-Fi because they've seen quite a few bands at the Hi-Fi, uh, and I couldn't get there the night that they played. And then I read some reviews that, you know, how they went, and, uh, and you know, I kicked myself to this day because they never came back to Australia after that tour. I think that we're talking about... 2010, 2011, um, and never got to see them. Uh, but going back to Bandolier, speaking of covers, because there's a lot of bands that have covered Budgie, and like like you discovered, a lot of us probably, you know, wouldn't know it unless you look it up. But Iron Maiden um, covered the song I Can't See My Feelings, which is another one of those great titles um, off the Bandolier album. So they've been covered by a lot of the um, later heavy and hard rock and heavy metal bands. And, you know, you see them budgie terms, their style couched in terms of um, a proto-metal or, yeah, proto-heavy metal because they're pioneers in, in a lot of ways of what they did. And a lot of these later bands uh, still pay, are paying tribute now because of um, uh, Bert Shelley's passing uh, and honouring them for um, pushing them into what they all became. So Budgie, even though a lot of us uh, had never heard of them, and, you know, even people now are going, well, who's Budgie? They really were 
the inspiration for a lot of the bands that you listen to now, like, you know, Metallica, Iron Maiden, Megadeth. There'll be others that I just can't think of at the moment. But anyway, so uh, like I say, mate, uh, really grateful for you uh, and gifting me with autographed copies. And um, Well, it's, it's, it's my pleasure. I, I It's like I, we were saying earlier, kind of like, Talking about earlier, you know, when you when you find a budgie fan, you you, you know you stay close. Like. <laughs> it's like a and, it's like a special gang, isn't it? We're in a special gang. Yeah, now. yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it, and it's like you know you were talking about the artwork. Um, I love the artwork. Even yeah, and and it's like art is so subjective that it's it's hard to say that's a, a bad you know to one person it's bad and another person it's good. But sometimes it's so bad or so weird that it's good, you know. It's like, like you said, the Bandolier album cover. Like when I saw that one, even and, and, and keep in mind, I had already bought Impeccable. But when I saw the album cover for that, I was like, really? Like, <laughs> what is this deal? Because birds aren't exactly what you think of when you think, especially budgies, when you when oh, you no. think of yeah. heavy metal or hard rock, you know. And you've got to have. You gotta be a band who has confidence or you just don't really care what, you know, you're, you're gonna do it your way kind of thing. If you're gonna put pictures of parakeets on your, <laughs> on your album covers, because you know, you got Judas Priest putting, you know, screaming for vengeance, this big, you know, a electronic eagle swooping down, you know, with the sharp talons. Budgie's got, you know, some, bir- some birds on horses, like what's going on there? And, <laughs> But, you know, even the song titles, you know, so you got, even on Bandolier, you got Napoleon Bonaparte 1 and Napoleon Bonaparte 2. It's like they're making plays on words and on uh, Never Turn Your Back on a Friend, you got the song You're the Biggest Thing Since Powdered Milk, you know. <laughs> and it, and somehow he managed in his brilliance to turn that into a great song. I could never write a song that had the for its chorus, the lyrics, you're the biggest thing since powdered milk. And I mean, I could, I could write a song like that, yeah. but it would, wouldn't be a very good song. Yeah. But, uh, so these guys are having a laugh. They are T- tongue in cheek. Yeah. It's tongue yeah. in cheek juxtaposition. You know, you got this heavy, heavy sound and we've got budgies right. on the cover, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a great sense of humor. And the artwork again. So. What I found that that was one of my early introductions because you know you had bands like Yes and um, you know a few others that were using Roger Dean album art and uh, so Budgie had Roger Dean on do uh, the art for Never Turn Your Back on a Friend so it was like that was another thing that prompted me I'm like okay obviously bands who use Roger Dean for, for their artists for their covers are all good bands so so I started. You know, digging in, if I saw a band who had Roger Dean Almart, I was like, I'm buying it. You know, I'm taking a chance on it. Yeah. yeah. And most of the time, 99% of the time, it, it, it turns out good, you know. And even, you know, mentioned Iron Maiden, uh, Derek Riggs, the, the guy who went on to do a lot of the Iron Maiden artwork, uh, he did a budgie album cover for Night Flight. And it's kind of funny too that on the album cover for Night Flight, if you compare it with Iron Maiden's Somewhere in time, they're very similar. Like, he basically just replaced the bird that's on the album cover with, uh, the Iron Maiden's Eddie character. Right. And sort of embellished the, the background or whatever, but there's, they're very similar. And, uh, so once again, we have, so we, we have a band who, who's got it all, right? They're, they're ticking all the boxes. They got the tongue in cheek. They can rock when they need to rock. They can be light when they need to be light. They can play their instruments incredibly well. I mean, take for example, uh, if I were Britannia, that album has got some crazy time, time changes in, in some of the songs, like just really cool, um, musicianship, you know, just outside the box thinking with, with, uh, the drumming and the, the rhythms and stuff like that. And, uh, you how you were talking earlier about them, you know, having missed them, seeing them live in New Zealand. <clears throat> no, here, here in Australia, it was. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. In Brisbane, right. the hi-fi. I was talking to a guy, I was actually at a Yes show, and I was wearing my budgie shirt, and um, I figured, you know, somebody there's going to appreciate the fact that it's a Roger Dean album, album cover, if, even if they don't know who the band is. So I was wearing a budgie t-shirt, and uh, the, a guy, he's standing in the ticket window 
um, to get in, and he looks back at my shirt, and he, he, he doesn't exactly strike me as somebody who's like a rock and roller, but he goes, buddy, what is that? <laughs> and I said, I said, oh man, it's just really cool. I mean, he's at a Yes concert, right? He's waiting to get in to, you know, still going to see the same band I'm going to see, right? I figure maybe we got some mutual, you know, interest or whatever. Well, we do with Yes, I guess, but so I said, man, it's this really cool band. They're like this progressive rock band, but you know, maybe not progressive in the way that Yes is, but, and he, I said, they, they're kind of like a, a mixture, if you could imagine, a mixture of Rush, with a with a kind of like a heaviness of Black Sabbath, and he goes, "That sounds terrible." <laughs> <laughs> and and then he just kind of he kind of put his nose in the air and walked off. So I'm like, I guess he must he must lean more toward the uh, symphonic side of yes. But um, and then once I got in the place, I was thinking of standing in line to get a beer or whatever. And uh, this other younger guy, he, he was younger than me comes up and he goes, Budgie, he's like, that's pretty cool. And he, so we started talking about Budgie. He knew who they were, but he said anything after Borge left once he didn't like anything after he had left. He's like, everything after that's garbage. And I'm like, well, that's your opinion. But, <laughs> um, and he, he told me, he said that, uh, apparently Budgie had played here in Dayton, Ohio in the mid to late seventies. And it had been, I guess, the late seventies. And I guess, um, so Dayton is like about 45 minutes from where I'm at, but he said that, uh, he said that they were opening for this band who was a Dayton band, but they were a national act, um, called the gods, um, not the gods, not the gods that the guys from Uriah Heap came from, but, um, G-O-D-Z, the gods, uh, kind of like a, I think they were signed under Kiss's management, Casablanca, but they were kind of like a, Kind of like a Kiss meets Blue Oyster called like a kind of biker, more biker version of Kiss or something. They didn't do the makeup and all that, but just stripped down rock and roll. And they were, they were huge for a minute. But, uh, he said that Budgie was the opening act and he said that, uh, everybody, when Budgie started to play, everybody left the club and then they came back for the gods. And I'm like, man, you missed the best, you missed the best band that night. <laughs> Because Budgie runs circles around the gods, but so yeah, it was just. I guess that just is a, a another attestation to the fact that Budgie's not everybody's cup of tea, and they're sort of like we said. There's it's sort of like a, a special club, you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's a it's a club with chops, right? Uh, yes, we, yes, we like we like a band with chops. Uh, in, yeah. in every area, and um, and as I mentioned earlier, they influenced so many of the bands that people listening to uh, in the uh, 90s, the 2000s, and even right up until now. Um, a lot of that comes from Budgie, and they weren't just a drop in the bucket. They weren't just the two albums. You know, they were you know 11 studio albums spread over a, um, uh, from the early 70s. Um, Right up to 2006, the final album. When when was their first album? Now, 70... 71. Or 72? Yeah, 71. Called, it's just simply called Budgie. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I noticed that um, one of the later ones... So, you know, they had, what, 10 albums from 71 to 82, and then there's a massive long break. Right. From 82 until 2006 with um, Cuckoo Land. A massive long break, but that album, Deliver Us From Evil, which is the 82, 1982 album, it wasn't taken to, uh, very well. I noticed that there's a, even to this day, there's a lot of, uh, critics out there about the Deliver Us From Evil album. And I think a lot of what I'm reading is because perhaps, uh, alluding to the Christian lyrics, leaning towards Christianity, because, um, by this time, uh, Burke Shelley, uh, had become a, a, a Christian. Um, mm -hmm. and what, what do you think about that one? You got thoughts on that one? What, what do you think of their philosophy pre that album? What, what's going on? I know we talked about the tongue in cheek and all that sort of thing, but before that album where, you know, we're leading towards sort of Christian themes. What do you, what are you thinking? Well, G'day, this is GK. If you'd like to hear more episodes of Philosopher Rock, just go to likefintradio.com. That's all just one word, like 
www.bentradio.com and hit the Philosopher Rock graphic pile on the welcome page. We also have a YouTube-only show dedicated to past newsos called 4550RPM, Remembering Past Newsos. It's on YouTube, and you'll have to search for this one as we don't have too many followers on there. But if you just type something like uh, Rock Drummer Cozy Pal, so type in Rock Drummer Cozy Pal into YouTube, you'll find us there. And please, when you get there, remember to like and subscribe. We've got many more episodes planned for 4550RPM. If you want to contact us, you can email us at philosopherrock at gmail.com. And there's two R's in there, so it's philosopherrock, one word, philosopherrock at gmail.com. Okay, let's get back to Philosopher Rock, episode 11, a tribute to Budgie and Burke Shelley, recorded February 2022. But before that album, we're, you know, we're leading towards sort of Christian themes. What are, you, what are you thinking? Well, you know, one of the other reasons that I like Budgie so much is that they didn't go into the whole sex drugs kind of ly- lyrics that a lot of the bands did. There, there might have been some, some lyrics to that sort of like hinted at, um, hey baby kind of stuff, but n- not, n- not real dirty. No. And, and they definitely didn't seem to talk much about drugs. Uh, if it was there at all, it was obscure to me, but, um. Other than I can't see my feelings. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I just figured that was a, 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 an allusion to metaphysics, you know, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't see my feelings. <laughs> an allusion to, uh, the, the spiritual realm. But he, not only were the lyrics, you know, fairly intelligent, but also I think, I'm thinking back to the song off of uh, Never Turn Your Back on a Friend, the song Parents, and apparently Burke Shelley had written that song uh, when he was like 15 or something. He was like, really young before he had been in a band or anything, and it actually made it all the way, you know, it was, it's a great song, um, so it, you know, it found its way onto a budgie album, but in that song he says, um, he's talking about his parents, you know, telling them what to do kind of thing, and and he says, uh, his parents tell him, put, put my trust in God. Who is he? I know not what. And he says, uh, something mommy said to me one Sunday. And it's like, it was there, you know what I mean? Whether he actually was raised that way or not, those types of thoughts were on his mind. And so it gives me, well, I, I do know, I don't know if you know the story about how he became a Christian, but apparently he had, uh, they were on tour and he stopped into some, I don't know if it was a bookstore can't remember, but he uh, was talking to some clerk at a store, and the guy, you know, basically asked him if he was a Christian and, you know, kind of witnessed to him, I guess, and and uh, Shelley, you know, was, had said no, and I guess the guy basically gave him the gospel message, and, and he was like, he was like, yeah, that, uh, that sounds right, you know. So getting back to the idea on Deliver Us From Evil, whether that was the reason for the critics um, response. I don't know, but I do know this. We were doing a budgie night, uh, me and my buddy about a week and a half ago in memory of Shelley's passing. And we were talking about that album and the way that it's produced and written is very different than, I mean, night flight had some hints to it, but night flight was still pretty raw and rocking. But when they got to Deliver Us From Evil, I'm wondering whether or not they were trying to not only emulate the bands at the time, like Starship, who were doing the hard rock, but with the real polished edge. Yeah. And, you know, and, and the keyboards were almost as, you know, dominant as the guitars. I don't, so I don't know if maybe, because that would have been the, the middle of the new wave of British heavy metal. And you think Budgie was kind of coming in on that early tide of uh new wave of british heavy metal and something like deliver us from evil might have might have sent some of them you know they were they were they were wanting judas priest you know something a little more angry like the older budgie so they may have been viewed as a like a type of a sellout album to try to you know make hits or be pop more polished pop rock but um honestly i don't think that the Christian lyrics or the Christian um, sentiment on that album is really overt. It's it's kind of it's it's woven in there, but it's I think it's um, and, and then you've even got songs like uh, "Finger on the Button" and um, and uh, "NORAD," which is 
kind of like a, that 80s, you know, Cold War scare of nuclear destruction yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. And so it might have, I don't know, I don't know if it was the, the lyricism or just the music itself or the production that, the, that sort of turned people off from it, but... I don't know. What do you think? There's mixed reviews with that album, um, and I was just wondering if it was because of those allusions to Christianity. But um, mm-hmm. Burke was definitely a believer. Like, there's the 2010 interview for the BBC documentary Heavy Metal Britannia. Yes. Yeah, and yes. he spoke about his Christian beliefs there, and that he said he was always been uncomfortable with occult-themed lyrics. Mm-hmm. So... He was definitely a believer, and he also rocked, you know, like he was, um, you know, one of the better bass players in this genre that you're going to find uh, if you have a listen to it. And, Brian, you you mentioned earlier, but his voice as well, you know, I mean, he could also, he's a great singer because, um, and, you know, they were just a powerful trio, and, you know, that that's it, they're gone now because with all due respect to all the other members that have passed through the band, you can't really have Budgie without Burke Shelley. So, um, and I know he'd retired from professional playing uh, quite a few years ago because he was unwell, but, um, yeah, it's a shame. I was going to reference the same BBC uh, film that you were talking about because I, I had seen that as well, and he makes some, some good points in there. Uh, that One of the points being that really struck me and – I've thought of this in the past, too, is the fact that, you know, he talks about the occult and how bands use it. And like you said, he wasn't comfortable. He wasn't comfortable talking about that type of thing because Christianity says stay away from it is dangerous. And I truly believe from my own experience, and I know you have experience in the occult as well, that it is dangerous. So we have, you know, we have firsthand experience knowing that it's not to be involvement in practicing the occult. Yeah. Let's be clear. Practicing the occult is a, is a dangerous um, endeavor. And um, one of the things that he mentions in that BBC thing is that you've got bands like Judas Priest and Black Sabbath. They're all, they're all you know, pointing at Christianity. It's, you know, you don't, you don't often see a band who is sort of mocking Islam or mocking Buddhism. And there, it's always sort of like a, a jab at Christianity, you know, you, you taking, taking what... Um, with a Christian idea and then twisting it like, you know, Black Sabbath. Obviously, Sabbath is a holy day in Christianity and Judaism and, and to, to say, you know, black, to put black before it is sort of a way of like making it unholy or whatever. And so I think it's a, a testimony maybe to the idea that Burke had already had these ideas and thoughts in his heart, whether he had accepted Christ as his savior at that point, you know, and, and you know, through his career up until, up until whenever it was the um, late seventies, early eighties, he still had that seed, you know, sown in his heart, I think. And um, I think it really comes out in the fact that he didn't fall for the easy road of Anybody can put some, some kind of pentagram on the front of their album cover and just sing about, you know, the typical stuff that, you know, the, the occultists tend to gravitate toward. But he, he actually was a little more creative than that, you know. Um, don't get me wrong, I get drawn in like everybody else to a really cool Black Sabbath riff or a really good Judas Priest riff, but Shelley was able to do, he was able to have the same kind of uh, musicianship but do it in a in a way that was um, you know even in the early days wasn't Christian, but it was still a little more intelligent maybe or thought provoking. So yeah, I just you know, I had seen that same thing on the BBC show, and I thought it was interesting. And then you know he had gone on uh, later on to do you know some stuff where he was jamming with some like locals in in his hometown of Cardiff, and. Uh, they had the one project, the Night Owls, and then there was one called Super Clerks. But the, the Night Owls, you can find some videos, and they're doing uh, uh, some really cool stuff. Like they do a Michael Jackson song, this woman singing, and, um, you know, Burke's playing the bass. And um, he was, so he kind of just took it easy and was just, you know, jamming in his local pub. You know, what, what that would have been, that would have been something to be able to go and yeah. hang out. Yeah. 
just be that close and, and, and intimate in a, in a small little like restaurant pub kind of place. And, uh, but I was going to mention, cause you mentioned his voice and how it couldn't be budgie without Kirk Shelley. And I totally agree. And it, and it, it's funny because the, after Metallica had released the bread fan, uh, B side, when I, I was trying to hear, I was trying to search out. Remember there was no internet. So before I had gotten a hold of the never turn your back on a friend album, that has Fred Fan on it. I was not able to find their version of the song, and I wanted to hear it really bad, like, you know, how, how the, the two versions, Metallica's version and Budgie's version, differ. But one time, there was a radio station here that for a little while they were playing really, they had like an hour, you know, dedicated to playing really obscure stuff. And I guess because Metallica had covered Bread Fan, they were playing the Budgie version. And I happened to turn that station on in the middle of that song that they were playing bread fan and and i'm I'm sitting there thinking like what is this and because metallica's version and throughout the middle where burke shelley does all this singing in this the slow part where it slows down he's doing all this like high pitch singing and whatever and uh metallica they just did a guitar solo i guess they didn't want to try to uh try to sing those high notes or whatever and so so i'm listening to it and then i hear the music kick back in and i'm like this is the original version of bread fan and i'm like what is going on in that middle part like and it was just funny because like once again he, he's just got an un, i i would say unmistakable voice i can think of, of maybe two other people who kind of sound in the same range a little bit i mentioned already getty lee of rush and and then the other only other person that i would say would be the, the singer from pavlov's dog but shelly i think has the better of the three of those voices because he, he kind of, um, he's got the grit when he needs it. Yeah. He's got the range. He's got the range. There's no doubt about that. But then when it comes to the softer songs, man, he, he he's just got this really soothing quality to his voice where it's almost like listening to, um, like an old sixties, like kind of like folky, kind of vibe, you know, I mean, he almost sounds like a, he almost sounds like a woman when he's in the high range on the, on the softer stuff. You know? Yeah. 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 So yeah, he, there, there could, there could never be another budgie that would be, you know, worth its salt if Burke wasn't at least singing for him. So yeah, I'll say that. Yeah. And as I said, with all due respect to everybody else who passed through that band, um, because the, it, it, all of the musos, um, you know, those early drummers and guitarists, they they had it, but you just can't have Budgie, um, you know, with a Burke Shelley. Sure, yep, I agree. Well, Brian, I think we'll leave it there. Um, you know, we consider this our tribute to Burke Shelley and to Budgie. And uh, like I said, Brian, I, I, I was in tears at his passing. Uh, you know, I'm not ashamed to tell the whole world that. But uh, your final thoughts before we move on to what's on your turntable. My final thoughts are that, and this has been on my mind ever since I found out that he was a Christian, that I'm very thankful and happy that he was a Christian, that he was saved, that he knows the Lord is his Savior, because we all, like I say, hopefully on every episode that we do, we all have sinned and we all know it. Uh, whether some of us are willing to admit it or not, but we need a savior before we stand before a perfectly holy God who has to punish evil. Um, because he is good, he, he will punish evil, but because he is good, he has offered salvation to those who are willing to take it, humble themselves and take it. And that's through the cross, the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, when I found out that Burke Shelley was a Christian, I was already a fan of the band, and it's just it was just icing on the cake. I was like, man, this is great, you know. Like I, I want everybody to be saved. There's not one person who I'm like, wow, if they became a Christian, oh, oh that's so good. <laughs> but it's but it's but it's just one of those things where you 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 know when it's somebody that you admire for for their talent, and you know, I'm just like, it's just going to be great, you know, to be able to have Burke Shelley as a brother in Christ for eternity. You know what I mean? So that's pretty much my final thoughts. What about you? 
Well, um, I, I can't say much more than to, as I said, confess that I was in tears at his passing. I've, I've known that he's been a believer for a while and I, you know, I was always excited about that. Um, and when I go back and listen to some of the albums, uh, like the two we just mentioned, um, uh, Cuckoo Land and, um, so Cuckoo Land and, uh, you're all living in Cuckoo Land and deliver us from evil. You know, I can go, okay, yeah, okay, I'll get it. Yep. I can hear it there. Um, and yes, like you, um, I know that um, when all things come to an end and uh, all of the believers are gathered together, I know that we're going to be able to hang out with the great Berg Shelley. And uh, we'll all be equals there together. Um, but, you know, on this side, I consider him a very great man and uh, very, very sad at his passing. But... Um, Brian, we always finish our show, well, we try to finish it every time. I don't know if we're successful uh, with asking each other what's been on your turntable this week. What have you been listening to? So I've been listening to a lot of stuff on the turntable. Like I said, we did a, a night for Budgie uh, a week and a half ago. But So that, that sort of goes without saying. But then uh, I got a copy of the new Yes album on uh, double vinyl and uh, gave that a couple of spins, but I'll tell you the one that's the one that's really got me head over heels is Molly Hatchet. You turned me on. You didn't even I don't even think you intended to turn me on to Molly Hatchet, but I I only knew uh maybe one or two songs and then I just out of curiosity because they're coming here with uh, one of my favorite bands in a couple months. I went ahead and went back to their first album and listened all the way up through, and I'm still going going through the catalog, but, man, those first four are really good. So I've been listening to a lot of Molly Hatchet, which is not exactly my normal forte, like uh, southern hard rock, but, man, they're, it's good stuff. So how about you? What's, what have you been diving into? Well, I'll just talk about Molly Hatchet for a second. I've been into Molly Hatchet since Flirting with Disaster album came out, you know, um, it's mm-hmm. one of those albums, because I, I love the Southern Rock sound. I love, you know, uh, dual lead guitars, harmonic lead, you know, lead guitars. Um, I just love that sound. And I, and I have for, well, since before then. Um, but, um, so yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of Molly Hatchet. And, um, uh, one of the guitarists in my band, he had, on his back, he has, the, the full size version is back is just the uh, album cover from Flirting with Disaster. So, uh, that can tell you a little bit, a bit about, you know, me and my mates, uh, love of Molly Hatchet. So, um, but yeah, listen, I've been listening to, I don't know if you might be surprised at this, but I've been going back and listening to, um, a bit of, um, Eddie Cochran and Gene Vincent. Mm-hmm. Um, some some of the early uh, uh, rockabilly stuff um, and listening to that. Now, there's been a reason for that um, because, um, you know, my wife is playing um, on her Gretsch. She loves her Gretsch guitar, which, you know, the mm-hmm. rockabilly people always had and still do to this day. Uh, so she's been, been right. playing a bit of the rockabilly sound and I've been following along, playing bass with her on that just for the... Uh, for the fun of it, her and I together. And so we've gone back to the roots of it there with Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran, you know, with um, Summertime Blues. But, um, you know, a lot of the early Brit bands were into Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran. Um, you know, if you think about mm-hmm. the Rolling Stones, uh, The Who, uh, T-Rex, they all give their mm-hmm. little tribute to uh, especially Eddie Cochran. Uh, so uh, the, there's that bit of heritage there you know, that the Americans took to the Brits and the Brits gave it back from that era. Mm. So that's what I've been listening to. Um, yeah, Eddie Cocker and Gene Vincent been enjoying that. So, um, and I don't know if you're surprised at that or not, but that's where I've been. <laughs> Garth, nothing surprises me from you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Well, that's, uh, I, I, I'm going to take that as a compliment. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, definitely take it as a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we'll leave it there. Um, Brian, um, as ever, thanks for your time. Um, I know we're on totally different time zones, so it's always a bit of an effort to get together and do something uh, meaningful, and uh, I hope our listeners are going to find this meaningful and understand that, you know, this is more tribute than anything else to the great Burke Shelley and to Budgie. So, Brian, thank you for your time. And thank you.
Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I just want to address a few things before I get out of your ears here. It would be apparent to many of you that I was a little naive in hoping to get an interview with Burke so late in the grand scheme of things. I knew he was very unwell, but because I had no intimate contacts, I just had no idea just how bad things really were going for him. Also, to the members of the Facebook group, thank you for your assistance that you've offered. And perhaps if I had joined up sooner, things might have gone differently as far as us being able to get in touch with Burke. Finally, to the members of the Shelley family, on behalf of Brian and myself, please accept our condolences. The loss of Burke has affected me personally, and I can only imagine how it how much it has affected you. I hope you accept this show for what it is, a tribute to a man who is sorely missed by so many from around the world. God bless. Let's leave the final word to Burke himself. This quote comes from the July 2020 issue of Classic Rock, and I quote, I'm not frightened of dying because I know where I'm going. I want to spend my eternity with Jesus Christ in heaven. Cause lines are crossed, you gotta count the cost and take the time to 